Good afternoon. My name is Quanah Brightman, Vice President of the United Native Americans. Uh, just to give a brief synopsis of who we are as far as United Native Americans. We were founded in 1968 in the Greater Bay Area in San Francisco. We were involved in the takeover of Alcatraz, Wounded Knee, a couple long walks across country. We led a group one time that took over Mount Rushmore. <clears throat> Been involved since 1968. My father, Lee Manel Brightman, started the first Native American Studies program in the United States at UC Berkeley, along with Dr. Jack D. Forbes. These men, you know, many of you have heard of Dennis Banks and Clyde Belcourt and Russell Means, but the true founders of the movement, they were actually educated people who had a foresight to try to get things and programs started. Today, I came here to support a lot of the people who've been disenrolled, disenfranchised, taking their tribal identity from them. You know, hearing a lot of the testimony here today, it really hurts my heart, you know. It really hurts my heart that, you know, this greed and this lust for money that we have with the casinos today, you know, it's, it was supposed to be a tool that we were supposed to be able to gain our sovereignty, gain more freedom. You know, that money could be used in so many different ways. It could be used in court where we could fight for our sovereignty. Be used in so many different ways as far as even this facility here that we have, our health centers. It could be used to revolutionize all these different places. Now there's one place out here, it's called DQ University. I don't know if many of you are aware of DQU. DQU is the one and only off-reservation Indian community college in America. Now in 1978 they had a walk, it's called the Longest Walk. Now, in 1978, all 389 treaties that we signed with the federal government, that is international law, they were threatened at that time by 11 bills in Congress where they wanted to do away with all of our treaties. They wanted to do away with our sovereignty. They wanted to do away with our reservation. They wanted to do away with our hunting and gathering rights. They wanted to do away with all the things that we hold sacred today and our lands. Well, because of this walk, all the people who organized at that time out there at DQU, that's the home of the Longest Walk. And it saved all of our treaties. Now because of today, we have Indian gaming. We have Indian gaming. But yet, do they even bother to send some of their representatives from their particular little tribal nations that are getting these billions and billions of dollars annually to put one or more of their representatives on the board out at DQU, to resurrect the one and only intertribal college we have here in this state. They wouldn't even have the money that they do today if it wasn't for DQU. This makes me very upset that, you know, back in the 1960s and 70s, when I listened to the stories of the elders and the founders of the movement, they sacrificed a lot for us and our culture to be able to survive. We resurrected a lot of our different languages, our culture, we made it acceptable for us by starting the first Native American Studies program. Now even today, you know, looking back, I've been involved, you know, helping organize some of the demonstrations that I've participated with Arrow with and John Gomez and Carla and a lot of these people who are here to try to bring voice to this. But the problem is the mainstream media will not cover this. Mainstream media will not cover these issues. They will not cover our issues because the majority of the people out there think that we're all rich. When you go to try to educate any non-Indian about what's going on in, in our little world, they all look at you and go, oh, well, you're rich. You have casinos. You don't have to worry about money. You get free everything. And it's like, excuse me, but that's not the case. That is not the case, and especially when I see all the families here who've been hurt and been victimized by these corrupt tribal leaders. And this is an ongoing thing. This is a completely ongoing thing that we've been having to deal with for many, many years. The Bureau of Indian Affairs is the main 
culprit that we need to basically get rid of, we need to abolish the Bureau of Indian Affairs. There's no Bureau of White Affairs. There damn well should be. There's no Bureau of Caucasian, or excuse me, of um, Chicano Affairs. There's no Bureau of Black Affairs. But yet we have the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Still, to this day, I want to read you this. I gave this speech when we went over to the Bureau of Indian Affairs office right down the street, went and saw Mr. Troy Burdick, and we protested him in his little um, inept abilities to dealing with some of the issues as far as protecting the human rights that we are addressing today. Dating as far back as 1775, the United States government has done everything in their power to dictate policy to all the tribes of North America. The Second Congressional Congress first act was to create three departments of Indian Affairs, Northern, Central, and Southern. The first department commissioners were Benjamin Franklin and Patrick Henry. Their job was to negotiate treaties with the tribes and to basically make sure they stayed neutral in the upcoming Revolutionary War. Fourteen years later, the United States Congress established a War Department and made Indian relations one of its main priorities. Mm -hmm. By 1806, Congress had created a superintendent of Indian trade within the War Department, whose main responsibility was to dictate the fur trade in the U.S.'s favor. This form of exploitation was carried out until 1822, when the factory system ended. This left a vacuum within the U.S. government regarding Indian relations. So, filling his white supremacy, created the current BIA without authorization from the U.S. Congress on March 11, 1824. Within a century, it has controlled virtually every aspect of Indian existence. Tribes have suffered from the Bureau of Mismanagement, Plagiarism, and Negligence. 389 treaties were signed between the original people of this land, you and I, and the federal government. All have been broken. We need international recognition of our treaties. We must help each and every one of our non-federally recognized brothers and sisters gain the same and same basic human and civil rights as federally recognized tribes. There are roughly 562 federally recognized tribes in the United States, with a total membership of about 1.7 million. In addition, there are several hundred groups seeking recognition, a process that often takes decades to complete. Federal recognition is important for tribes because it formally establishes a government-to-government -government relationship. Status as a sovereign entity carries with it significant privileges, including exemptions from state and local jurisdictions. These exemptions generally apply to the land that the federal government takes into trust for a tribe and its members. Additionally, federally recognized tribes are eligible to participate in federal assistance programs. These such programs, tribal governments may receive funds that they can use to provide community service, such as health clinics. Historically, tribes have been granted recognition through treaties by the Congress or through administrative decisions within the executive branch. In 1978, the Bureau of Indian Affairs established a regulatory process for, for recognizing tribes. The current process for federal recognition founded in Part 83 of Title 25 of the Code of Federal Regulations. This is a rigorous process requiring the petitioning tribe to satisfy several mandatory criteria, including historical and continuous American Indian identity in a distinct community. Each of the criteria demands that the exceptional anthropology, historical, and geology research presented of evidence. The vast majority of petitioners do not meet these strict criteria, and far more petitioners have been denied than accepted. In fact, only 8% of the total number of recognized tribes have been, have been granted this recognition since 1960. The BIA, bully Indians around, have been in the business of judging evidence from tribal communities seeking federal recognition. Federal recognized tribal communities are often non-supportive of 
of recognized efforts of tribal communities in part because they see the recognition of additional tribal communities as taking a share of their current inadequate and probably dwindling financial support from the federal government. While in recent years there has been considerable attention given to the economic development and casino income, most tribal communities remain largely dependent on these federal funds. Economic development and gaming successes are distributed unevenly throughout Indian country. Federal recognition of these tribal communities implies fewer federal resources for many tribes that often need these funds. Now the divide and conquer that has been used against all the people of color by the dominant society has been successful for these past hundreds of years and counting. We can achieve equality with the dominant culture when and only when all indigenous people are united. Unfortunately, Indian gaming, these casinos, has turned the red road green for some. With Indian gaming casinos, you now have a majority of disenrollments of original families, with thousands within the last few years alone. The BIA requires that you be one-fourth or more blood quantum in order to be recognized and eligible to receive services from them. Unfortunately, this system was forcefully adopted by many tribes across Turtle Island. If we keep this system in effect, our people will vanish forever from existence within the next hundred years. We encourage every tribe across Turtle Island to use lineal descent as the main means to prove a person's birthright. Many Native American people have gotten so used to the idea of blood quantum, degree of blood, that sometimes the origin of its racist concept is forgotten. The federal government began to use degree of blood in the latter part of the 19th century essentially to finish the extermination of our people. Why are we the only race of people who must prove who we are through blood? Thank you. Greed is not walking the red road. We must think as our ancestors did and practice socialism. There are tribes opposing other tribes from starting gaming operations because they fear the disease of greed infecting their people. Gaming is a double-edged sword and it cuts both ways. We need to unite all Indian nations and communities as one voice, one people, one force. That can happen when we start looking through the eyes of indifference, the intertribal politics. We are all one race. We are one blood. We are one people. In 1990, Congress passed the Native American Graves Protection and Reputation Act requiring the return of human remains and sacred objects to Native American tribes and nations from which they came. Yet today, over 110,000 human remains of our ancestors, which are used by anthropologists, or better known as grave robbers, hundreds of thousands of our ancestors' remains have ended up in displays, as well as in these dusty shelves and in forgotten drawers of depositories, museums, and universities across the country. When it comes to the state recognized tribes, the Office of Federal Acknowledgement, which is controlled by the BIA, must address this issue by granting the same human and civil rights as members of federally recognized tribes in regards to proper burial of our beloved mothers, fathers, friends, and children who are waiting return to be honored and buried with dignity. Today, BIA claims to want to play an advisory role as tribes work towards self-determination. Yet every recommendation, every recommendation that we have voiced to try to remove the dictatorship that they have has not followed through. I ask each and every one of you, why is that? Each tribe is a sovereign nation. We never wanted or wanted any outside influence telling us what to do, how to look, how to talk, or where to live. I thought these days were over with. Yet the white man refuses to relinquish control over our people. When 
We are all slaves in a system of government which has done nothing but try to exterminate tribal existence. Genocide is a better term for it. How else can you explain it when the BIA is overseeing the order to sterilize over 50% of our women through HEW? There are known facts through the Avaras report that was published back in the 1970s that proved that they were using our people as guinea pigs for the pharmaceutical companies. Yet that hasn't been brought up by anybody in these listening posts. And this is a new form, this role of termination, disenrollment. Each and every one of you, I'm glad that you all are here. Because it takes all of us, the healthy people in the community. When you see something going on in your family, when you see something going on in your community, you have to speak out. You have to be that person to be brave enough whether you're a man, a woman, wherever you are, you're an elder, step up. You see somebody doing wrong, just like some of the things that were voiced from Carla here. If somebody, if a pedophile came into your community, you got to step up and say something. Doesn't matter who you are. We got to give voice to the voiceless again. Because the bottom line, we have to produce our own media. We have to continue to produce our own media. We have to continue to be heard in a very respectful way. I want to thank each and every one of you for coming out here and supporting John Gomez in their fight. We will not stop until we have succeeded in getting some justice. What do we want? Justice. When do we want it? Now. What do we want? Justice. When do we want it? Now. You know, let's, let's see these people who are elected to supposedly represent us, actually do those things. Thank you.